I'm Fred Dreyer. I used to be a fixture here for about 50 years, but I'm now on the research staff at the University of South Carolina in Lincoln, Florida. Ben invited me back to introduce Rolf, and this is the first time in many years that I've had actual enough freedom to come and listen to lectures in, in our series, and so I'm really glad to be here. I've known Rolf for ages. We, we identified at least back till 1974, but I think it's closer to 1970. I arrived here in 66. Um, welcome to discussing an application-driven subject involving combustion. How many of you have heard in the last year or two combustion is going to disappear? And fossil energy is going to go away. I have a nice button that says, I love fossil energy. <laughs> Why do I love fossil energy? It's because if I improve the efficiency of fossil burning systems today, I can in the next two to three decades reduce carbon emissions by as much as 30%. And that's larger than the reduction I can get by instituting biofuels over that period. Why? Because there's a distribution system for the energy itself. There is a developed industry which has inertia, but we push it towards these things. So what I want to explain today is my interest in applications driven fundamental science. That's a really important issue. Not science that's going to make a difference in 2100, but science that's going to make a difference in the next 10, 15 years that's going to get us. So don't think fossil energy is going to disappear. It's going to be the way we raise the living standards globally. It's the only way we can raise the living standards globally. So I'm glad to see you interested in this subject. You can't have a better person to discuss the fundamentals in engines. He has a long career in this subject. He's remained a main state piece in this area, even as he's retired in the last year from Wisconsin, and is still operating within the context of this company. It's a pleasure to introduce Rolf. I know you're going to enjoy the fundamental lectures, and I'm hoping that you will all, by the time you get to the Wednesday, appreciate how those fundamentals affect where we can go with applications in a problem that I will call a sloppy problem. It's a sloppy problem. And the models are sloppy because we don't know all of the interactions. We don't know all of the interactions. That's where empiricism and engineering come, but that is being guided more and more by fundamentals and the things we can do with computational fluid dynamics today that are still sloppy models. Don't forget that. And they have to be more sloppy if we want to do parametric design. But that doesn't say we shouldn't understand the science. I hope you will enjoy the next three days with Rolf on his lectures. Thank you very much, Fred. Uh, as you mentioned, we've known each other for many, many years. So I'm not sure that I've ever given a course to you before, but. <laughs> So uh, this is actually a two-part course. I'm giving the first three days, and then my colleague, uh, uh, Professor Carl Gatti, uh, will be talking the last two days. And his uh, interest these days, having worked at Saudi Aramco uh, and just retired from Saudi Aramco, is really the role that fuels are going to play in the future. And are there other alternatives? So for example, he just published a paper that I'm sure he's going to mention a lot in his talk. Uh, is the internal combustion engine dead? And I'll leave him to answer that question, but I'll give my answer during this presentation, which is no. <laughs> OK, so uh, I'm from the University of Wisconsin-Madison. I'm part of the Engine Research Center. Uh, we have you know, between 50 and 100 graduate students working with four or five faculty on engines. Uh, and it's been around since the 40s. So it's, uh, that just shows how important engines are in, in our world. <clears throat> 
Uh, this is just an outline of what I'd like to cover. Uh, I'm going to be talking a lot about a review of the basics, the fundamentals in day one, that's today. Uh, I'll be looking at thermodynamics, so this will be a review for some of you. Uh, and I'll also just touch a little bit on 1D and 3D modeling. And then tomorrow, I'll talk about the actual computer modeling of engine processes, including combustion physics and chemistry, and then an application to premix charged spark ignited engines. I like to give this first because actually they are the most complicated engines that there are uh, for reasons we'll get into. Uh, then I'll talk about spray modeling, and then the final day will be really applications and the use of these tools, these modeling tools, applied to optimizing engines. And I'll talk about spray combustion, diesel combustion, and low temperature combustion uh, on the third day. Okay, uh, just to kind of start things off, I'd like to mention to you a question, and that is, why did I spend my whole career working on internal combustion engines, and why should you work on internal combustion engines? So if you look at uh, the, the facts that uh, Fred mentioned, and let's just go down to the picture at the bottom there, we are not a horse and carriage society. To move people and goods, we need fuel, we have to burn it, and we want to, we want to burn it efficiently. Why the reciprocating engine? There have been many, many uh, alternatives proposed to the reciprocating internal combustion engines. For example, in the 70s, people had the idea, why don't you just put a solar panel on top of your car, and you don't need uh, fuel, right? Well, they didn't consider that actually there's not that much energy impinging on the roof of a car. So that idea went out the window. Other concepts have been proposed, and some are still actively being considered. Uh, I consider many of them to have failed. Uh, Stirling, rotary, solar power, I just mentioned, certain stratified charge engines, two-stroke, hydrogen, fuel cell, battery, elect battery electric vehicles. These are things that Gautam will talk to you about in more detail. But basically, the internal combustion engine has withstood the test of time. It is basically the most efficient engine that we have as, as, a, as a group uh, discovered so far. The other thing is that the environmental impact of internal combustion engines has been reduced by more than 99% during my career due to exhaust after treatment and various other combustion optimizations. And if you look at battery electric vehicles, for instance, uh, they actually use energy at the power station. And if you look at the, the, the efficiency of, of, for which uh, that process is uh, currently uh, conducted, you'll find that internal combustion engines are equal or better than battery electric. And again, Gautam is going to give you more detail. However, there are many challenges. And one of them is that fossil fuel combustion has been thought by some to be a cause for uh, warming or climate change. And this is a whole subject in itself, and I'm going to just cover a little bit on that in a couple of slides. But this is an area where I think research scientists really need to focus uh, a great deal more, more attention. So just in summary, we just cannot create energy out of nothing. Uh, even horses needed energy. Uh, fossil fuels have built our world. There's no better alternative that's emerged yet. Uh, in order to maintain our quality of life, we need uh, energy. But energy use has become political. And this is one of the, the challenges that young people, I think, face, uh, is to essentially uh, realize that you know, each of these ideas that came over here were major ideas. For example, hydrogen engines. President Bush said we were going to convert the entire vehicle fleet to hydrogen. Well, it didn't happen. But that was a politically driven decision, and it didn't happen. So you, really, I think research is the only way to sort through these uh, these possibilities and, and come to uh, an agreement about what the long-term solution really should be. Uh, and of course, I think it's obvious uh, that f uh, fuel efficiency is one major component. As Fred mentioned, if we can improve fuel efficiency, we are going to have a major impact on our society. So society uses internal combustion engines widely. Uh, for transportation, commerce, power generation. I just list some of the things over here. Uh, they power the 600 million passenger cars and other vehicles on our roads. Uh, in the United States, we're, we have 260 million vehicles. That's one per person, just about. Uh, 
There's uh, 77 million cars made annually in 2016. You compare that to 2000, you see a huge increase, and part of that is because of the explosion in the China market. A quarter of all vehicle or cars, that is, are produced in the European Union, and until recently, 50% were diesel. Uh, and again, there's been some issues that I'll talk about with, that are changing this number in favor of gasoline engines. But internal combustion engine research spans both gasoline and diesel power plants. They use a lot of fuel. 70% of the 96 million barrels of crude oil that we consume daily are used in internal combustion engines. Just in the United States, 10 million barrels are used per day in cars and light duty trucks, 4 million in heavy duty diesel. And that works out to two and a half gallons per person in the United States. That's a huge amount of fuel. And then of course, a lot of that in, in years gone by, a lot more was uh, imported this costs the economy significantly. I really like this chart, which shows uh, energy flow from the uh, Energy Information Agency. To summarize, the world uses 500 times 10 to the 18 joules of energy. Uh, I'm talking about annual use here. This is uh, called exa, this uh, exponent. So there's 500 exajoules. And if you look at the United States, we use 100 exa exajoules, so that's 20% of the total world energy consumption. You look at where that energy goes, here's petroleum, here's natural gas, here's coal, you add these numbers, that's 86%, or 86 out of 100, which it's convenient that it's a percent, easy to determine percent. 86 exajoules are used by essentially fossil fuels. Tiny amounts are used by solar, wind, uh, and some of these hydro, uh, some of these other things here, more, of course, in nuclear. But this chart really points out just how reliant we are on fossil fuels. The other thing this chart shows is how that fuel energy winds up in lost energy and useful energy. This is kind of a sad sight. 55% of the energy that we use is thrown away. A huge amount of that loss is in electricity generation. Uh, same is true if you look at uh, petroleum use. 70% of the fuel is used for, of liquid fuel is used for transportation. There are large inefficiencies associated with that as well. Uh, I think this chart also uh, is, is very interesting because it shows what would be required if you decided, well, we're going to convert the entire fleet to batteries? Well, you'd have to get the power from this source, okay? And where does that come from? Well, coal and natural gas. So basically, you're using fossil fuels, even if you decide you're going to uh, run on batteries. And in fact, if you look at what that would imply, you have to go from 12.46 of distributed electricity to an estimate I made be roughly 18 uh, 0.8 exajoules, uh, and if you look at the efficiency, which is only about 30% efficient, that would mean that we pretty much have to increase the amount of electricity generation by 50%, at least, if we wanted to replace uh, liquid fuels with uh, battery electric. So these are huge numbers, and you have to realize it's not going to change overnight. Okay, so let's just talk about the fuel consumption a little bit. I mentioned 96 million barrels per day. Uh, if you consider six to seven billion people on the planet, that's 0.6 gallons per person per day. The US, I mentioned, has, has more use than that, obviously. But why do we want to use fossil fuels? As I said, 86% of the US supply comes from fossil fuels. And the reason is that fossil fuels are just a fantastic storage medium for energy. If you look at just simple uh, stoichiometric combustion with uh, uh, octane, for instance, you see that by burning uh, octane, we get CO2 water and we get 48 megajoules per kilogram of fuel. Well, how much is that? Well, the kinetic energy of a 1,000 kilogram car traveling at 60 miles per hour uh, turns out to be the same as the amount of energy in 10 grams of gasoline, or a third of, a, of, an, of an ounce about a teaspoon of gasoline. Huge amount of energy that you get from uh, fossil fuels. 
Along with the uh, production of this energy, though, we get emissions, right? CO2, for instance. And if you just do some back-of-the-envelope calculations, you see that if we have, say, a billion vehicles on the planet, each burning, say, two gallons a day, uh, you would be consuming roughly 300 exajoules uh, of energy every year, which is, remember, 500 was the total on this, uh, that we used. So it's on the order of magnitude of this. If you think of how much CO2 one kilogram of gasoline makes, that's three kilograms of CO2, you wind up with the estimate that we produce 6.7 gigatons of CO2 per year. That's 6.7 times 10 to the 12 kilograms. Interesting just to look at this number. Humans, the seven, six, six billion humans on the planet, exhale CO2 and roughly one kilogram per day. So that's three orders of magnitude less. So by using engines, we're actually increasing the amount of CO2 that we, as a species, deliver to the atmosphere by three orders of magnitude. Uh, it's interesting to compare that with the total uh, mass of air in the, in the atmosphere, uh, which we can estimate. And if you take the ratio of these numbers, you get 1.3 parts per million per year of CO2 is added to the atmosphere from vehicles, engines. It turns out that this is about 25% of that that is measured. Uh, there are other sources of CO2, agriculture, uh, building, concrete, and so on. Um, so it's a very complicated problem. Some interesting facts about CO2. I just thought I'd mention this for a second. Uh, you know, you have to realize the amount of carbon, hydrogen, and oxygen on this planet is fixed. And they participate in a system with sunlight. So photosynthesis uses the sunlight to convert CO2 into hydrocarbon and vegetation. And then when we burn fossil fuel, well, that came from decayed vegetation that was stored underground eons ago. When we oxidize that fossil fuel, we are essentially converting previously stored sunlight back into CO2. It's kind of an interesting thought that uh, it makes you realize that we're basically burning stored sunlight energy when we burn fossil fuel. If you look at the energy budget, there's some references at the end of the presentation uh, that you can look at, and they're in, identified in boxes here. Uh, according to this reference, the, sun reaches, the sun's radiation reaches our atmosphere, upper atmosphere, about 1.4 megawatt per square meter. That would be directly above the equator, of which 70% reaches the ground on a clear day, and 30% is scattered back into space, depending on cloud cover and so on. But if you average that over the entire Earth, accounting for nighttime, surface curvature, and so on, you get that this number drops down to about 175 watts per square meter. So with a relatively efficient solar panel, maybe you can light a, a light bulb, right? 100 watt light bulb, with one square meter. If you take that number and just average it over the circumference or the, the surface area of the Earth, you see that the total sun power that's available is 89 thousand terawatts or 90 petawatts. Uh, if you convert the uh, joules, the, the 500 uh, exajoules to annual rate, you find that man is using 15.8 terawatts. So the ratio of these two is 0.017%. More energy comes from the sun in one and a half hours than we use in a year of consumption. So the sun is just an amazing source of energy to forget these numbers. Some facts about CO2. If I just look at combustion of, say, methane, which uh, you see has four CH bonds, burning in oxygen with two O, o bonds, producing CO2 and two H, uh, H2Os. Uh, looking at the bond energies, you can see that most of the energy release comes from uh, during the rearrangement of these bonds, comes from O2 being converted into CO2. To break the CH bonds, I get roughly the same amount on this side when I produce OH bonds, 411 versus 460. So basically, it's, uh, the energy really comes from uh, converting O2 to, O2 to CO2. Um, of course, when we make CO2, we are making greenhouse gases, including H2O. And just to remind you, the reason for that is that combustion gases have uh, absorption bands in the infrared 
So the short wavelength radio radiation from the sun can penetrate the atmosphere, but uh, to, in order to balance the energy in with the energy out, we have the issue that the re-radiated gases, or energy rather, is absorbed by the gases, and the, therefore the atmosphere is heated. And in fact, without global warming, our air temperature on the planet would be minus 17 degrees C instead of the average, which is 13. So there's a 30 degree difference just because of the fact that we've trapped uh, gases that uh, absorb in the infrared. So <clears throat> this uh, just indicates the importance of global warming. Uh, for example, here are some calculations that were done of the outgoing long wavelength radiation uh, by this reference here. And they show that if you take the, all of the gases in the atmosphere uh, and compare that to an atmosphere without gases, uh, that the uh, outgoing radiation is reduced by 30 percent uh, due to the presence of these atmospheres of the atmosphere. But one of the things that's I think startling when I started looking into this is that water vapor accounts for a huge amount of the greenhouse effect. You know, 66 to 85 percent of the greenhouse effect is due to water. 70 percent of our planet is covered by water. And water evaporates and then the process cools and then condenses in the clouds and heats the, the air. Uh, I mentioned there's 90 petawatts of energy impinging on the planet due to the sun. 40 of those are in this energy transfer. So it's a huge amount of energy that goes into vaporizing water, forming clouds, and then rain. Uh, oceans really have most of its water and they have a dominant effect on atmospheric CO2. For example, at the equator, CO2 actually is liberated from the ocean because the ocean temperatures are warmer, whereas at the poles, CO2 is absorbed into the oceans. They're very complicated. And the fact is we have this huge ocean that essentially stabilizes the climate. Uh, and this, uh, the fact that water plays such a big role uh, is emphasized in a very recent paper from Princeton, actually, where they point out the uncertainty in climate models can really be traced back to the understanding of cloud physics. It's a really unsolved problem. So I just want to mention that, you know, when people talk about the effect of CO2 on the climate, they really are glossing over a very, very complicated problem. You know, if you uh, take a look at just uh, Wikipedia, you'll see some incredible numbers. The energy stored in the gases in our atmosphere is 150,000 exajoules compared to the 500 exajoules that we, that we use. The amount of rain, global precipitation, is five times 10 to the 17 kilograms of water that, cha that uh, falls on our planet versus the 6.7, 10 to the 12 kilograms of CO2 that we emit. That's five orders of magnitude more. Uh, natural decay of organics, forests, and so on release 440 gigatons of CO2. We release 6.7 gigatons. Uh, so, as I say, very complicated. Well, uh, what are the solutions if you're worried about CO2? Well, one is, well, as Fred mentioned, use less fuel, right? And that's a no-brainer, right? So more efficient combustion is, is an obvious uh, way to go. The other is plant a tree. There's three times 10 to the 12 trees on the planet. Each one can store 20 kilograms of CO2 per year. Multiply those numbers out, you find that it's a huge amount of CO2 that's tied up in vegetation. And that brings me back to what I said at the beginning. Our fossil fuels come from the decay of those, of those trees. Okay, so that's all I want to say about the uh, uh, sort of background. Why do we want to use an internal combustion engine? We want to convert the energy contained in the fuel into useful work as efficiently and cost-effectively as possible. So uh, if you take a look at uh, your textbooks on internal combustion engines, you'll see elementary analysis of a, of a heat engine uh, uses the Carnot cycle where you have a heat source, a heat sink, and uh, you, you heat a, a, a working fluid uh, and produce work. Well, an internal combustion engine is actually a little different than the Carnot cycle. We provide fuel and oxygen. We do internal combustion, not external combustion, as in the Carnot cycle. And then we, of course, uh, extract work, but we also have combustion products. And those combustion products actually turn out to be useful, potentially, 
Uh, we can use them to drive turbines, for instance, or we can actually try to recover some of the uh, energy contained in the, in the unburnt fuel. Right? So it's a little different, but the, we can get very far by analyzing uh, an external combustion concept for uh, its thermodynamic characteristics. So engine efficiency. This is uh, also kind of a startling slide. Uh, if we take the fuel as being 100% of the energy, by the time we're done with the engine, we get 18.2% of this 100. Where does it go? Well, 62.4 of this 100 goes as losses. Uh, we also idle the engine, and here the 17% of the, of the fuel energy goes to just waiting at the, at the stoplight. Uh, of course, with the idea of hybrid engines, maybe you can turn off the engine and, and avoid some of this loss. Accessories, you could argue this is useful, uh, air conditioning and so on, your radio maybe. Uh, driveline losses now, after your 18% from the engine, there's another 5%. Uh, that brings us down to 12% that's actually feeding the, the wheels. Where does that go? Well, drag, rolling resistance, and of course, braking, you could argue, is not a real good use of energy if you drove smartly. Maybe you wouldn't need to brake, but the point of, of this is uh, you can see that the overall system is fraught with inefficiencies. And in fact, Professor Hayward from MIT points out that the real number is 1%. So we actually use only 1% of the 100%. Now, how does he get that? Well, he says that about 16% of the chemical energy is used for useful work. You know, braking is not really counted, for instance. The average weight of a vehicle is 4,000 pounds. Uh, average occupancy is 1.6 persons. So the average person weighs this. He picked a, a light number. I guess the, there must be kids involved in his calculations. You come out with 1% efficient. It's terrible. So if we were to rethink about how we use vehicles, we could make major changes in the amount of fuel that we use as a society. Of course, when we burn that fuel, we also have to worry about pollutant emissions, unburned hydrocarbons, um, carbon monoxide, nitric oxide, particulates. I already mentioned to you the CO2. Uh, but CO2 is directly tied to how much fuel is burnt. So if you can devise an engine that is more efficient, in other words, burns less fuel, you'll produce less CO2. However, diesel engines, although they're more efficient than spark ignition engines, have higher nitric oxide and soot emissions, and these have serious environmental and health implications. Uh, so, for example, diesel manufacturers now use almost universally selective catalytic reduction for NOx reduction. Uh, this requires basically another fuel carried on board uh, called carbamide, or urea, uh, and this has to be injected into the exhaust to complete a chemical process that reduces NOx back to nitrogen. The cost of this is about 1% of the fuel flow rate for every one gram per kilowatt hour of NOx reduction. And uh, if you look at the design of typical engines today, they're around five grams per kilowatt hour of NOx. So uh, we're talking 5% of the fuel just goes to clean up nitric oxide from diesel engines in particular. Also, soot uh, for diesel engines is a problem. Uh, you have a filter that accumulates the soot. You require periodic regeneration, and you do this by enriching the fuel air mixture to increase the exhaust temperature, burn off the soot. This is another 3%. So you add these numbers together, and you know, you're getting uh, maybe 8%. Uh, of fuel penalty just to clean up the exhaust from a diesel engine. And that reduces the uh, advantages between the diesel and the SI engine significantly. And uh, of course, there's also the whole political side, as you probably all have seen, uh, VW and other automotive diesel uh, companies have been implicated in basically misleading the public about how much NOx is actually produced from the vehicles. So these are major concerns that need research to solve. Okay, I'm gonna go really fast through the next few slides because this is stuff you probably had as an undergrad, but just so we're all on the same page, talking about the internal combustion engine. And here's our combustion chamber. We have exhaust valves, we have intake valves, we have a spark plug if this is a spark ignition engine. 
I'm showing you the piston located at top dead center. Of course, it's connected to a rotating crankshaft here. And here it's location at bottom dead center. Uh, the compression ratio is the ratio of the bottom dead center to top dead center volume. The stroke is the distance it travels. The bore is the diameter of the cylinder. Uh, so you can calculate the displacement volume, which would be the bore, pi bore squared uh, times stroke divided by four times number of cylinders. The power produced would be the work that you extract times the speed, or the torque times the speed. And so here we'd see a typical uh, formula for calculating power in kilowatt. The break mean effect of pressure is the power divided by displacement and speed. Um, and that's used to indicate basically a, 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 in the dimensions of pressure uh, the performance of uh, an engine. Um, and so you see here, this is in kilopascals, for example. And then the brake-specific fuel consumption is the mass flow rate of fuel divided by the power. So I mentioned before the units gram per kilowatt hour. Those are specific units then. So if you look at brake, what does that mean? Well, gross indicated means if I measure the cylinder pressure in the combustion chamber here, and I integrate it using the fact that work is integral PDV, I get the gross indicated power or work. Uh, the pumping is what, it's re what is required to pump the, the fresh gases into the combustion chamber and then exhaust them. And then if I add those two, I get what's called the net indicated power or, or fuel consumption. And then the final contribution is friction. So you hear brake indicated uh, and, uh, in, and gross indicated and net indicated, all those terms used to describe the performance of engines. So engine power, uh, if we look at the uh, indicated power at a given speed, you'll see one thing you can do to increase the power is to get more air into the combustion chamber. So that was where this pumping comes in. And we'll see, we'll talk about turbochargers in a while. That's how you can get more air trapped in the combustion chamber. Uh, the other parameters that you see here are the uh, energy release or lower heating value of the fuel. Uh, in other words, we assume that the fuel exits the engine as vapor water rather than liquid water, so that's the lower heating value, uh, and so on. And if you just look at this, uh, at the at estimates of this power for spark ignition and diesel engines, you'll see that the brake-specific fuel consumption range for spark ignition engines is typically between 270 and 450. For diesel, 200 to 360, roughly. Um, so you can easily figure out an efficiency knowing these numbers uh, by using our 46 megajoules per kilogram that we estimated for octane before. Uh, and if I choose this 200 number here, I see that the fuel conversion efficiency for, say, a diesel is between 40 and 50 percent, uh, which is actually pretty good uh, when you consider that uh, nationwide, for coal power plants and so on, the efficiency is estimated to be around 34%. So diesel engines are very efficient, actually. However, if you look at this engine over here, this is a state-of-the-art GE uh, 500 megawatt combined cycle gas turbine. They are roughly at 60%. So there's room still to improve engines to get up to this uh, type of efficiency. And we'll talk a little bit later as how to some ideas on how to do that. Okay, here again is uh, stuff you had in your undergraduate. Uh, <laughs> people say an engine operates by sucking in air, squeezing it, bang, that's the combustion, and then <laughs> blowing it out. <laughs> okay, so basically the intake process, you basically take in the air, here's the volume of the combustion chamber going from top dead center to bottom dead center. Then I compress it. Uh, and then I do combustion, and then I expand or compress, uh, transferring work to the crankshaft. And then finally, I do my exhaust process that brings me back to top dead center. So this loop down here from one to four is the pumping loop. Uh, and the gross uh, part of the work, the uh, indicated work, would be the area under this part of the curve here, going from bottom dead center to top dead center and back. So uh, that's uh, basic um, uh, equations that are used by an, uh, people who make cylinder pressure measurement, for instance, and we'll talk about that. So let's just review briefly uh, combustion thermodynamics or thermodynamics that we'll need. 
Uh, okay, with zeroth law, basically says that at thermal equilibrium, uh, all of the items uh, that are in contact are at the same temperature. The first law, this one we'll use a lot. Basically, it says that during an interaction between the system and its surroundings, the amount of energy gained by the system is equal exactly to the amount of energy lost by the surroundings. So if you look at this uh, system over here, we're adding energy from the surroundings and we're re rejecting energy to the surroundings. Those two must be the same. Uh, energy gained would be from, the, say, the intake flow. We have, for instance, a turbocharged engine, uh, the energy of the combustion, the lost energy is the work, well, here it's negative because this is actually what we want. And then the heat loss to the cylinder walls and so on due to heat transfer and friction. So that's our first law, and we'll use that a lot. The second law is also very useful uh, because we can use that to actually compare the performance of uh, combustion devices. Uh, we introduce a quantity called entropy, <clears throat> which is related to the amount of heat crossing the surfaces of our, our system divided by the temperature, plus an irreversible part due to losses that are basically uh, unre uh, unrecoverable. And so uh, the, the second law basically says that uh, there's only one limit in which uh, this inequality, uh, the equality holds here, and that would be if you had a reversible process. And if you have, at the same time, a process where uh, there was no heat transfer, then the entropy change would be zero, or the process would be isentropic. So we're going to use that assumption of isentropic process quite a bit when we look at uh, the ideal engine. Anyway, to, re to reduce irreversible losses is one of the goals, and that helps you to increase the thermal efficiency. Uh, just I'm going to throw these up for a second. Uh, the equations of state, we have our ideal gas equation. Here R is the universal constant divided by the molecular mass of the gases in the combustion chamber, our two equations of state uh, relating the internal energy or the enthalpy, they are related through this equation here, to the temperature changes by, by means of constants, the specific heat, the constant volume, constant pressure. And the ratio of those two is the ratio of the specific heats, gamma. Uh, and here's how we can calculate entropy using Gibbs's equation which relates changes in entropy to changes in internal energy and changes in pressure with the volume uh, shown here. We can integrate this equation actually between two states uh, by using our uh, caloric equation of state, for example, and show that the change in entropy between two states can be related to the temperature change and pressure change uh, or the temperature change and volume change. Um, so, I mentioned the uh, isentropic process. So, if we have an adiabatic, there's no heat transfer, reversible, that means no irreversible losses due to friction and so on, then the entropy change during the process is zero. And that means we can use those two equations to relate pressure and temperature, or temperature and volume. And this is the set of results that we get. And these are very useful because if I measure the change in volume, and I guess what gamma is here, I can actually estimate what the pressure is or what the temperature is. So that's uh, very useful. And in fact, this just shows an example of that. Uh, Otto cycle is typically an example of a spark ignition engine uh, process plotted on a temperature entropy diagram here. <coughs> From <coughs> state one to state two, we do isentropic compression, so constant entropy. So I'm assuming that during compression, it's happening so fast that I can ignore any heat losses uh, to the walls, and I have an isentropic process that's uh, reversible. Then I add heat due to combustion, and this is a constant volume heat addition. Uh, I then expand from state three to four with my uh, expansion stroke, again isentropically, and then I have my heat rejection. So this is a, a sketch, if you like, that's very useful for determining engine performance for the uh, auto cycle or the spark ignition engine. Diesel is basically the same. The only difference is that in the combustion process, we typically assume the pressure is constant rather than the volume. Uh, and other, other than that, the uh, picture is the same. 
And by the way, John Haywood's books, and he has actually a new, he just released a new uh, edition this year. So you should uh, take a look at that. Um, so we can use these equations to look at some other things that are kind of interesting. So just to give an example, let's look at what's called HCCI combustion, homogeneous charge compression ignition. But one of the things that uh, you'll see with homogeneous charge compression ignition is that it occurs at the same time everywhere in the combustion chamber. That means it's a very fast combustion process. So if I look at this plot here, which is temperature of the combustion gases versus crank angle or time, uh, as I compress, I reach a certain point where suddenly I have combustion and I get almost a vertical line here. The temperature increases everywhere in the combustion chamber at the same time because it all goes off with a bang. Uh, so how could I analyze this? Well, <clears throat> if I take a look at my first law of balance here, first thing I notice is that during the combustion process, the shaft work is zero because the integral from, of PDV, the pressure work term, is zero because the volume didn't change, right? T begin and T end is very close. So because of the fact that the shaft work is zero, I can just relate the change in energy to the amount of heat that's uh, liberated. I can estimate the amount of heat liberated knowing the heating value of the fuel and the amount of fuel. And the energy here I get from my CV uh, times DT. And that allows me then to estimate what the burn temperature is given the temperature at the beginning of combustion. So that's kind of a useful use of the first law just to show an example. Now, of course, in reality, uh, we're not only interested in, spark, in HCCI engines, we're interested in many different types of engines. And so you'll see in most industries widespread use of zero dimensional models for combustion. So here's just a kind of a picture that you might think of. You have an intake, you have an exhaust, and here you have a combustion chamber. Uh, it has a changing volume with crank angle or time due to compression of the piston. And you can measure the cylinder pressure. Uh, I'll talk later about why we don't need to make measurements of pressure everywhere in the combustion chamber. But for now, we just make a measure of pressure. And we plot that pressure versus crank angle. And here's the plot that we get. Well, we can analyze that to determine more about the combustion process by using the first law again. Here's our energy change. Here's our pressure volume uh, work term. These t this term here represents the amount of energy that is uh, brought into the combustion chamber during the intake process and uh, leaves during the exhaust process. So we're measuring that with uh, mass flow rate of, of those uh, fuel oxidizer and the enthalpy that they carry. And on the right-hand side, we have the heat loss term, which is basically the difference between the combustion energy release and the losses due to heat transfer, for instance. So if I use the ideal gas equation, I can relate, I can eliminate T here and relate it to pressure and volume. And I get that the net heat release is given by this equation. I measured pressure. I know the volume change versus time from knowing the piston position as a function of time. So I can basically calculate uh, the net heat loss. And you'll see in the literature uh, people plotting plots like this, heat release rate versus crank angle, derived from this equation, which is measured pressure data, like we're showing here. And uh, you can see that this heat release actually has characterized by two spikes. Uh, we'll see later this is the premixed burn, and this is the diffusion burn. Um, so that's how you could actually calculate uh, more details about the combustion process from the measured pressure. I'm also showing data here that says predicted. I'm going to talk later about the use of computational fluid dynamics to model the same process. But here I just wanted to show you the fundamentals that an experimentalist would use. Uh, you can also refine things and get an estimate for the combustion energy heat release by cooking up a formula for the heat loss. H here is the in Newton's law of cooling, the, heat, the uh, convective heat transfer coefficient, surface area, wall temperatures, and so on. And if you, if you know this, you can then subtract that or uh, subtract, multiply, uh, sorry, solve for the combustion energy release. But that's typically not done because you have to make a lot more assumptions. Okay. When we start talking about 
uh, one-dimensional equations, and one of the starting points is to look at what's called the Reynolds transport equation. And basically, the example I like to give uh, that uh, helps you understand this, and you can think of where I'm headed here, is I've got this uh, turbocharger that's supplying uh, oxygen to or air to my combustion chamber. But in this example, I have a, a bottle of fire extinguisher material, CO2, and I've connected a balloon to the mouth of the vessel through a valve here. And I want to know how this balloon fills up, fills up with time. So the first thing is I have to note that this gray region here is all of the CO2 that was originally in the bottle, and that's called the system. And we know that the rate of change of mass with time in the system must be equal to zero because the CO2 is not leaving my system. Everywhere this gray region exists is my system, and that's fixed. So I, that's the easy part of the equation. Now I want to identify the balloon, and I'm going to call this my control volume, this dotted region here. Well, I want to know how that uh, balloon changes its size, for instance. Well, the Reynolds transport equation says that the rate of change of mass in that control volume, the density times its volume, must be balanced by the rate with which mass crosses this uh, surface here, which defines the surface of my control volume, which is the density times the velocity relative to the control volume dotted with the, uh, the component that's uh, in the normal direction to that surface uh, times the area. So if I uh, do a quick calculation and I say, well, let's assume the density is constant, the volume is just 4 thirds pi r cubed, so this term on the left-hand side is the radius of the balloon, and the right-hand side is rho times V times A, which is the mass flow rate across this surface. You notice there's a sign change because the velocity is in the opposite direction to the normal, so that's why I have this balance. So this is a fundamental equation called the Reynolds transport equation that I'm going to be using uh, later. But it's also fundamental because it helps you understand the intake process in an engine. So here we have our intake valves, here we have the exhaust valves. The valves, this is time down here, bottom dead center, top dead center, bottom dead center, top dead center. Here we have the exhaust valve lift uh, as a function of time. Uh, we're also plotting here the cylinder pressure <coughs> during exhaust. You open the valve, you see the cylinder pressure drops drastically as flow leaves through the exhaust. Uh, and then at a certain moment, the intake valves start opening. Uh, and then we essentially recharge the combustion chamber. So the, the intake system is actually quite complicated, right? We have to worry about the flow through the filter, the carburetor, if you have a carbureted engine, the throttle plate, uh, injector, manifolds, ports, valves. So all of those things need to be modeled. But ultimately, uh, what we're interested in is the rate with which the flow crosses the surfaces of these valves uh, and enters the combustion chamber. We can, deal, we can improve that by supercharging. So for instance, we uh, might uh, introduce uh, turbochargers uh, to try to get more air into the combustion chamber. Or uh, at the very least, we want to design our manifolds to have the nicest, smooth possible flow to prevent losses and to get the most amount of air into the combustion chamber. Uh, the uh, losses that occur uh, are due to flow resistance, um, we have flow separation, and we also have unsteady effects like uh, due to wave action in the runners, and I'll talk about that in a second. Um, so basically, uh, one of the important things, as I showed you earlier, is in order to get uh, the most power out of an engine, you have to have the most air that you can get into the combustion chamber. So the quantity that's called volumetric efficiency measures just how much air you are able to get into the combustion chamber uh, and is of great interest. And this plot here from Haywood really is a, a very informative plot, and let me just show you a little bit about it. So this axis here is the volumetric efficiency. Obviously, you want 100%, but in reality, you get this solid black line here. So why is that? Well, <clears throat> what he does is he goes through the analysis of all of the losses. Down here, we have speed. So the first thing you notice is this, uh, what he calls quasi-static effects. So you have gas left over from the previous cycle 
because you don't squeeze all the gas out during exhaust, you're always left with what's called the residual. So that would be uh, an immediate reduction in the amount of air that you can get into the cycle, for the combustion chamber for the next cycle. Okay, so the next one is uh, this line B here, so which reduces uh, the first line that you see. And that's due to charge heating. So you have uh, hot, exhaust, uh, hot valves, hot manifolds uh, that heat up the gas as it's flowing into the combustion chamber. Its density decreases, which means that the amount of mass that you can get into the chamber is reduced. The other thing that happens is because as you increase the piston speed, you increase frictional losses, typically at the square of the flow velocity, you see a reduction in the amount of air that you can get into the combustion chamber due to friction. Next is, to take you from C to D here, is what's called choking. And we're going to talk about that too. But if the flow velocities start to reach values comparable to the speed of sound, you'll eventually reach the point where you can no longer pass any more flow. That's called choking. The ram effect takes you back to curve D. Uh, and that's because, as we'll see, uh, there's a certain inertia associated with the flow. So it keeps on going even when the valves are uh, about to close. And so you can actually force more air into the combustion chamber than you would be able to do without that effect. Uh, and then there's tuning, uh, making sure that the pipes are appropriately uh, configured to minimize losses. Uh, backflow, this can happen, especially at low speeds where you have exhaust flow uh, actually going back into the intake or intake flow going back into the intake because the intake valve closes during the compression stroke. So this is a very interesting curve. And in fact, um, it's uh, used, for instance, by Mercedes-Benz in their three-stage resonance intake system where basically you see three different configurations here. They correspond to changing the length of the intake runners such that at high speeds you have the shortest runners possible. Uh, this way you minimize uh, some of those frictional losses and so on. Uh, and at low speed, you want to make sure that you uh, have a corresponding design with the longest path. Uh, and this has also to do with uh, RAM effects and so on. But by superimposing the different configurations here, what Mercedes is able to do is to extend the uh, volumetric efficiency curve over the entire engine speed range and keep it close to 100%. It's pretty cool uh, engineering. OK, so to summarize what I wanted to talk about this first hour, transportation is a third of the energy use in the United States, and internal combustion engines are among the most efficient power plants known to man. But we can improve them more, and that's what we're going to talk about uh, following. Modeling tools, we'll discuss some of them, are available to help quantify the performance and provide directions for improved efficiency and reduced emissions. But the industry really faces pretty significant challenges to meet emissions, nitric oxide, soot, and so on, as well as CO2 targets. But significant progress has been made in the last 30 years. And I just want to show this plot. It's, it's actually amazing. This is the United States heavy-duty emissions chart that shows the regulations by the, department, by the EPA uh, in terms of particulate matter and NOx. Starting from 1988, where NOx was at 10 grams per horsepower hour in this case, and soot was at 0.6 grams per horsepower hour. Uh, the first re regulation reduced the NOx down to 6 grams, and then there was 1990, 1991, and so on. And now you can see where we are today. It's unbelievable. We're at 0.2 grams of uh, NOx and 0 .0, something, 0 0.02 grams of particulate. And people are talking about restricting this even further. So when I mentioned at the beginning the 99% improvement in emissions, uh, this is part of what I was talking about. Pretty amazing. So uh, this last chart, uh, I was talking to my wife about the lecture here, and she said, if you took all the cars on the planet and put them in one place, how much space would they take? Well, it turns out that if you took every car on the planet 
And you could squeeze them into Delaware, which is hardly visible on this, on this chart here. But, but it's, it asks the question, can it, and it's basically 10 to the minus 5 of the surface area of the Earth. Can a 10 to the minus 5 speck pollute the entire planet? This is an interesting thought. <laughs> So uh, at the end of each of the lectures, I have uh, references that you can go back and take a look at. We have time for a couple of questions. Yeah. That's a very good question. Are we changing the amount of evaporation from the oceans? You know, there's... Uh, Maybe uh, Fred's heard about this, the Gaia hypothesis, all right, which basically says that we have this self-healing system. So if you make more water vapor, it turns out to act as a, as a, a way of equilibrating the system uh, such that you drive it back down to its original state. I don't know enough about atmospheric chemistry to be able to argue that, but it seems like we've been able to survive as... A, a planet for thousands of years with very different values of CO2 and water in the atmosphere. So I don't know. But that's a very good question. cycle is an even larger sloppy problem. Right now there's about a 50% uncertainty in the effects of chlorinated and chlorinated species on global warming issues and particulates in the upper atmosphere on this issue. About 50% uncertainty in global warming numbers from that that you haven't even thought about when you're thinking about CO2 pollution. So I believe in global warming science. I am very skeptical about the predictions. And I do know that the predictions are that the best thing we can do is to reduce the number of vehicles, and what vehicles are going up, and increase their efficiency. Okay. But just to get back to the evaporation question, if I make more clouds, there are you know, changes, and I reflect more sunlight. Back. So, I mean, it's a very complicated problem. Very, very complicated. That was the point in that Princeton paper that I mentioned that you guys really should look at if you're interested. Um, Nature Communications 2017. So remember what I said. When, when we have very complicated problems like this, when we build a model, what do we do? We try to test it against what we know in terms of information. Well, the information we know in terms of global warming is historical. And it's very different time, uh, time constants than what we're talking about today. And this has been a long serious argument about it. If you're really interested in this subject, I invite you to look at the website of LAMP, L-A-M, here at Princeton. Harvey LAMP has written a couple of very interesting papers on this issue that I think would be more stimulating. Okay, we should probably see this, please. So we'll, we'll convene in 15 minutes.